Hi, welcome to the Family Teams Podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and we can't wait to chat about all things family. All right, guys, welcome back to the Family Teams Podcast. We are here with our friends Cameron and Michelle Akrami. Thank you guys for joining us today. Yeah, excited about this. Yeah. I'm glad you guys are here. Help us have this conversation. Yeah. So part of what we, we're doing is kind of going through a, a series of conversations around kind of a, for lack of a better word, a code for how to live differently as a family team. There are certain things that you value that are a little unusual than maybe the the average or what's what people uh, see as normal. Other people think this way as well, but, but definitely when you're trying to build a multi-generational team on mission, these things become more than just maybe another option. They become really ideal. And so we were kind of walking through these. And the one that we're going to talk about today is assets over career. So this is the, uh, the part of our lifestyle where we start to think about work very differently. So I'm going to read uh, just this quick little essay for you guys and get Cameron and Michelle to chime in uh, on their thoughts in April as well. So Assets over career. What do you want to be when you grow up? This was not a popular question with our ancestors. They were raised in a family and they were given an identity from birth as sons and daughters, then taught to one day look forward to being husbands and wives, fathers and mothers. But we no longer think this way. We're taught to see adults through their work identity and kids are instructed to prepare to construct a work identity of their own. We're taught that work identities bring freedom while family identities are suffocating. But for those who want to build a family team, and see life lived in and through family identities, resisting career identities frees us to experience a family-centered kind of life. Work becomes nested within a larger category of family. This happens when, instead of provision through careers, a family builds, owns, manages, and expands assets. We see this pattern in the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see this pattern in the Proverbs 31 woman. We see this pattern in the way Jesus describes stewardship in the parable of the talents. Historically, this was how most families thought of work until quite recently. Families who build assets instead of individual careers get to experience a different kind of family life. Some of those advantages include uh, integration. Husbands and wives, sons and daughters work together and build their relationships at the same time they build economic engines. Two, household. It turns their family into a place of productivity and increased purpose that invites and enfolds both family members and those who assist the family team. Number three, time. Asset stewardship allows fathers and mothers to redeem more of their time to follow the Deuteronomy 6 pattern of talking and teaching through the everyday events of life. Number four, wisdom. The successes and failures of asset stewardship teach valuable lessons that make it difficult to play the victim and help the family to grow and mature. Number six, flexibility. No family knows when they will need to pour more time into mission, rest, or unexpected emergencies. So asset assets owned by the family can be made to flex around the changing priorities of the family. And seven, abundance. Making money in a non-linear way gives room for for God to bless the family with windfalls that open up new options. Most importantly, careers have a tendency to push family members into their individual identities while asset stewardship promotes teamwork. This all starts with a mindset shift. And now is one of the easiest times in human history for families to build assets at minimal cost but you first must choose this path. Okay, so that's kind of just giving people a broad overview of the perspective. And I know uh, Cameron and Michelle, you guys have thought through this and have been through this transition. So I'd love to hear what what about in the essay does that start for you? Well, I think that the idea of assets is such a foreign idea. It feels like a foreign language, even as you're describing it, as I try to think through this for our family and hear that essay, it resonates partly because we've been wrestling with this and thinking through it, but it also is so at odds with the cultural pressure or momentum. And it feels like learning some sort of foreign language that I don't quite have a grasp of yet, because sometimes I'll, I'll have it and then sometimes the words just escape me. And so hearing that, it sounds really exciting, but it also seems like a uniquely American problem in, yes. in the sense that it's, we're, we're so affluent that we almost have the choice to do these things. And I think that's one reason why it's a little bit hard is this is the this is our, our mother tongue is you go to school, yeah. you, you know, get a college education, you go into a career and then you hope to retire and then die with, you know, you, you, you want your money to outlast you. Yes. And that's kind of the, the norm. And so it's, 
refreshing, I think, to hear that, but it's also really foreign. You don't quite have a lot of examples around locally, obser observationally, to be able to say, oh, I know totally what that means because I've seen it all around me. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Michelle? What does that start for you? Yeah. I mean, similar to what to Cameron said, I think it's something that it's it's like, you know, when you're trying to take a different road, it's remembering that you're on a road and you're staying mm. on that road. And, you know, there's been moments where, I mean, for me, as we've been making changes, like I'll have my doubts, but then when we go that way, I just see such like illumination like this. Okay. I get it now. You know, we've had just so many conversations in different aspects of life and it's brought nothing but life for us as mm. a family. And so we're really grateful to be just in this journey together. And we've learned so much from you guys. And we're very grateful. Yeah. This, I know that your family, April has kind of thought this way and you, you've seen the impact of you know, these different paths. What, yeah, what does it start for you? Yeah. I remember I'm having a flashback of as a kid, my dad making us all come clean out this really gross apartment mm -hmm. and just nasty, smelly, stinky. And I found out, you know, years later, realized that that was one of my grandpa's rental apartments mm -hmm. and probably had an eviction of some kind. And we had to go in there and <laughs> clean this stuff out. But I, so it was just a part of, without me knowing what, what it even was, mm -hmm. I think it was part of my upbringing. And then like, that was my dad's side. And then on my mom's side, it was very much a farming family. We had, we have land that had been a land grant from the Revolutionary War. So it'd been in my family for, you know, 250 generations or something like that. And so it had just been like, I mean, years, not generations. And <laughs> just the idea of, being in the same place and growing, you know, you can see my great, great grandfather's name on things in the town that he helped. He was like a trustee of the cemetery and his name's on the like pillar, the outside of the cemetery with amongst other names. There were the, the county seat is in my t hometown. And so that's where the fairgrounds is. And so you go there and there's this, all this stuff from both sides of my family that are represented there. My grandpa that owned the properties also owned a motorcycle shop and mm -hmm. my dad was a mechanic for him and in his younger years. And so just all this, but they just owned their own things and passed things on. My, those grandparents had an orchard, an apple orchard that was like maybe 40 acres mm -hmm. or something like that. And so those are things I just like swam, swam around me. My uncle started a landscape business. My other aunt had a skincare business and a salon, like a hair salon. So I was just around that conversation a lot and heard things discussed. And so it was very easy for me to kind of transition. And so I saw the flexibility of the lifestyle as well. And my dad would help his siblings with their businesses and help them set up their books if they started something new, things like that. And then my dad helped us with our businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious for you, Akramis, can you share some practical, like you've had kind of maybe a big picture shift, but what does that look like for you? Like, what were you doing career-wise? What have you shifted asset-wise? And then even Cameron, your history, like your family history, I know you have some overseas connections and things like that. Yeah. Generally speaking, so I was in a really weird quasi, not quite ownership mode, but I, I was in a career mode where I, I was a college dropout actually originally and ended up getting a job that was in this healthcare staffing field. And I was in this one position for a while. And then I moved and have been in the same spot for 19 years now. And it started out as me just being an employee. And over time, about halfway through that journey, the owner kind of let me start running everything. So in a weird way, I was kind of stewarding somebody else's. I was truly stewarding something mm -hmm. and thinking with an ownership mentality. Uh, but it wasn't until really the last year or so is we ended up acquiring ownership of both of the businesses that I'd been running, um, a majority stake of both. and. So that, I kind of was a bunch of the way there, but not on the asset side. In other words, if something happened to me, I had no actual ownership in the business before. Mm -hmm. And so having that switch has changed and it does shift something, even though I was stewarding it and I was doing a faithful job. It's just different when you, I'm looking further down the road when it's actually ours. I'm thinking, okay, what do I want to be true 30, 40 years from now, 80 years from now? whether it's these businesses or what do these businesses parlay into. So it shifted the timeline, I think, in which I'm 
viewing these businesses and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting though, because my dad actually was a small business owner. We moved to California. He had a little pizza shop that he was helping to co-own. And then right after that, he ended up getting into service stations. And so he was a small business owner. And even though we had some proximity to that, we really weren't talking about any of it, you know? So it was almost like he may as well have been going off to work because he insulated us from a lot of the the things that he was, you know, the considerations, the stresses. He didn't want us to be worried about things. He just wanted to provide. So even though my dad was living in our house, running his own small business. I didn't really have access to that sort of thing. That's in terms of careers. That isn't really talking about material assets. That's more of just kind of a, you know, his profession was the business that he owned. Yeah. But it seems like a lot of people that when they think about this, they actually put entrepreneurship in a career category. This is what I find to be the most frustrating misunderstanding. So uh, and it certainly can be in that category, but like I, I never, they, they say, oh yeah, maybe five, 10% of people are entrepreneurs. And so you could be a doctor, a lawyer, an entrepreneur. It's all, it's, it's all framed underneath this category of career. And I didn't become an entrepreneur because I was pursuing that as a career path, as opposed to other career paths. I became an entrepreneur because I wanted to build a family. You know, I wanted the advantages for my family. And, and I really think of it as a different way of provision. Like it's really a, it's, there's a category, there's a category that comes before choosing a career. And that is, how do you want to provide? Do you want the provision to come through primarily renting out your time for money? Or do you want provision to come through owning assets that cash flow and provide income in a nonlinear way for your family? Those are just different ways of provision. And I think it's, it's possible then to, to go down to the career path and say, I want to be an entrepreneur as a career, but that's, that's not what we're really talking about. So I think that that's, that's a big confusion people have. I know a lot of us had the paradigm. I certainly did. My initial paradigm shift was rich dad, poor dad. And really what he addresses in that book is he kind of goes head on and takes on the assumption that renting out your time for money is a safer bet. Go get a, you know, get a degree, get a career, learn an expertise, rent out your time for money. And that's the safest way to provide for your family and to provide a future pension when you retire and everything else is is high risk. And he really breaks down in detail that assumption. And to me, reading that book completely demonstrated that that is that is that that, that is not uh, couldn't be more false that that as an employee, you're always one person's decision away from losing access to all of your income uh, and that the idea that this is a safe path, you know, that there was there was maybe an argument for that 40, 50, 60 years ago uh, during a very particular time in economic history. But for the rest of basically human history, we've had a situation where that was not the ideal. And so that's we we are living, I think, in, a, in a, that time again. And this is kind of what we want to signal to people is that, man, this is a great time to own assets. People just providing a simple service-based business, whether that be, you know, in the trades or in, you know, in servicing businesses, like through marketing, what you're doing, Cameron, servicing businesses through staffing, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for very little cost to start an asset, to build an asset, and then to begin to build a portfolio of assets. And just thinking about provision that way. I'm curious for you guys, I listed kind of a bunch of advantages because I think that there's kind of a couple of ways to go about this. One is to make the economic case, which I, I Rich Dad, Poor Dad makes, and we don't need to make. Um, I think it's an open and shut economic case. And I think that the case is getting stronger, not weaker, especially as inflation goes up. Uh, it gets more and more uh, clear that this is a better way to actually make money. But there's also the question, and what I really want to emphasize is there's an impact on family culture, right? There's a, there's a different way you see the future of your family. We talked about you know the whole idea of, of flexibility, integration, wisdom and time and abundance of those kinds of advantages. What what are the advantages for you guys that really have caused you to want to think this way, that, that this feels like a better fit for your family? Need a blueprint to revise your family to be a multi-generational team on mission? The book Family Revision by Jeremy Pryor is the book that summarizes all the big picture ideas you hear on this podcast, available on Amazon or familyteams.com. Are you following us on Facebook and Instagram yet? Look up at Family Teams to get even more free content and never miss out on event announcements. I think it's been um, the flexibility 
and just really focusing on the multi, you know, generational aspect of it. And it's been really, really cool as like Cameron's led our family and just, I'll catch myself even in moments where I'm, you know, talking to a kid about like, oh yeah, you could get a job at Chick-fil-A someday. And like Cameron will just come aside and be like, like trying to kind of help the kids get like a broader, you know? And I'm like, oh yeah, like I know. And it's just ingrained, you know, but those moments are like catalysts for change, you know, where we'll have the conversations with the kids and, you know, we're on the cusp, well, we're in them now. We have a 13 year old. And so we're walking through lots of conversations about things that really relate to what we're trying to cultivate. And so, and choosing a different story. And there's been times where I've even had moments where I'm like, gosh, like we probably just need to tell our kids, you're going to stand out, like just being upfront with them. Be ready to be weird. Be ready to be weird in a good way. And like really supporting them in that. But it's been really good. And I, it's been, yeah. Do you have something to add to it? Well, I, I think one big advantage is if you're thinking multi-generationally, your job ends with you. I mean, you don't have to die for it to end. You could get sick and it can end or whatever it is. Whereas having either a business or some sort of other assets that are generating income, I think that extends the timeline of the usefulness. So it's like, if I'm going to spend my time now, I can either be gone from the family and earning some money to put into the family or I can be working with the family to put money into the family in things that are going to persist beyond me and hopefully bless my grandkids and great grandkids. And so I think it has also given an opportunity. It's it's required, it's required more intentionality in terms of the conversation because you can just you can just autopilot life and they will go into the the academic career path automatically. And so what it's forced is if we're going to do something that's different, I think one of the benefits is it's forced some engagement and hearing my kids' hearts and it's forced some more involvement than maybe I would even, I, I have to be intentional. I can't just check out and hope that it ends up like this because it's not going to naturally happen like this. It's not, they're not going to naturally think of income generating assets. They're going to go the career path. And so because I see the value in this asset path, it's forcing me to engage a lot more. So there's a lot more shoulder to shoulder with my kids, face to face with my kids. And that's getting buy-in. And there are all these little ancillary benefits that aren't the primary thing, but are end up just being benefits in terms of creating more community, creating more teamwork, because we're we're having to be intentional about communicating this. And frankly, part of it is me communicating it so that I can kind of internalize it. Cause I'm so I feel like we're that whole thing where, you know, the only thing you need to teach third grade is a fourth grade education. And that's what I feel like sometimes, like I'm just, I'm just a little bit ahead of them because this is still so foreign in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. So it's helping me to internalize that. So I don't know, there are all these little benefits aside from the economics. I think the cohesion in our family, getting them to think through ideas, it's kind of spurring stuff on because they're so young. Their 13 is the oldest. And so if we can get our nine-year-old thinking about this or seven-year-old thinking through this lens, they're going to have that much more time to think through this and to kind of flex those muscles. And so I think that's a really exciting thing. It's going to cause them to engage with the world in a more realistic way, as opposed to one that's just conceptual, where they're just going to, at age 27, are going to be confronted with reality. I'd rather that they see a little route in our neighborhood of selling eggs. What are the downfalls? What works and doesn't work practically? And so I'm excited about those benefits as well. Yeah, that's so good. I, I love the ability to like just level up the whole family in terms of our economic education at the same time. And and you can really give your kids an enormous head start by exposing them to this is how we make money. This is you demystify work. And a lot of people have no idea what their parents do for a living when they're in a career. Uh, and so you can you can bring them in and show them and give them real practical skills. And those can pay huge benefits, not just economically, but now they know that, oh, we 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 get to work together. I'm curious, April, for like you've seen us go through this transition. I, I did pursue a career path. I got a, I got an education in theology. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life doing full-time ministry. We spent a couple of years doing that. And then we transitioned into asset building. I'm curious, yeah, what are some of the benefits that you saw that transition begin to accrue for our family? Well, I feel it felt much more naturally t natural to me, first of all. So that was helpful. I could, I feel like I had a better understanding of where I could like fit in, but I think now that we have this much perspective, it's been years, you know, so I can say, 
I feel like it's broadened your shoulders, Jeremy, for like your, her fatherhood. I think this year on fatherhood, father's day, it just really hit me. I was writing Jeremy a card and thinking, you know, what, what came out of my pen was very different from what I have written in the past. You know, I think a lot of times I think father's day and I think like, oh, the kids and the way you interact with this one. And it's it's all about the kids. And I wrote this whole entire thing and I didn't mention the kids once because I was thinking through all the different things that he's had to do while in our journey of asset building to that were hard, you know, like we got sued by new line cinemas when we had Tolkien town and he had to deal with that. He had to learn how to like have a lawyer and what, what is intellectual property and, you know, all these things. And I remember in that season, him feeling like the Lord was telling him that we had a leaky basin and that he needed to shore it up. And so what does that even mean? And so he just like, he was forced to figure out what, where our leaks were and to shore them up. And, you know, when you, when you embark on these, on these asset building journeys, you are saying, I'm, I'm going to have to figure this out. Like I'm not just going to go into work and do what my boss tells me and then leave at the end of the day. I, this, the buck stops with me. And so I feel like as a man, as a leader of our home and as a father, husband, Jeremy has really grown a lot through the, just the things that come with living in a fallen world and trying to build something, the challenges that can come that way. So I, I feel like those transitions have been some of them very, very sudden and huge and some of them very slow and gradual. And he's, we've done a different, like different amounts of doing it well in terms of communicating with each other and staying on the same page throughout the process, the transition and all that stuff. So there's definitely, that's part of the dance, right. Of, you know, becoming one and being one and staying one and all of that. But I I love that it's given us so many opportunities to work through those things. If he was just going off to the same job every day for a lot of years and like, how, how would we be growing? What would be changing? What would be different? What would be the new challenge? So that is one thing I appreciate about the asset building is that it gives us new challenges to face together and to have to like work through and figure out that used to scare me, but now it's like, okay, we've done this yes. enough times or iterations that it's like, okay, here's the next challenge. Yeah. Well, I want, I'd love to hear too, specifically about, <clears throat> cause so April's describing the impact this has on fatherhood and man, I've seen that enormously with men I've mentored, guys that Cameron and I interact with at Integrated or the fathers at Family Inc. and how this is really helping them really reform their whole idea and mature in ways that they've never uh, thought they would. But I, I think that maybe even a more dramatic shift culturally is the impact this has on motherhood. When I th- when I read the Proverbs 31 a description of this woman who's like building assets with her husband and with the family, as a mother, you can't ever be anything really more than in terms of building assets through the family. It's difficult to 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 go beyond, you know, sort of the the domestic duties at home if if the if the family's not building an economic engine. And you know, a mother could do that by herself, but I think it's amazing when a father and a mother, a husband and a wife choose to do that together, it transforms what it means to be a mother. She becomes a part of stewarding the economic engine. I think for a lot of mothers, they can choose to either stay at home and just be focused almost on almost exclusively on non-economic activities or to go get a job and pursue a career and do those things as an independent uh, person from the family. But what if a what if a woman wants to be fully integrated as part of the household and she wants to contribute economically without being disintegrated in any way from from being rooted in the in the household? And and this is some and you see that in Proverbs 31, the way it's described. And yeah, I want to hear from both Michelle and April. How, how do you think this impacts motherhood? Any thoughts about how this has impacted you personally? Yeah. I mean, I feel like going back to kind of a beginning with that, there was a moment for me two years ago, I think it was, we were visiting my family in Oregon. We had an afternoon hike and we had really been talking and praying through a lot of these ideas. And he was doing some YouTube, you know, um, cultivating there for like a side business. And I had some hesitations. I really was like, oh man, like this is taking a lot of time. Just, I had, you know, some hesitations and I really clearly remember a moment on that hike where I felt the Lord say to me, you need to tell him that you are with him in this. 
even though you don't get it at this point, like I, he, I'm, he's following me in this. And I was like, oh. You know, and so I I told him and I mean, I can't speak for you, but I know you've shared that that was like a huge, that was a turning point for him too, that he felt entrusted, you know, with this role, like, you know, and I've, we've had, you know, uh, we've been married for 18 years and sought to, you know, build our lives upon the Lord and his word. And so I've wanted to be that submissive wife, but this felt like a, like it was a very clear, like submit to him in this. And in that has been so much beauty, you know, I, that the weight of that moment is not lost on me anyway. So with that, it's been so cool. I feel like instead of our separate roles or our roles being separate of father and mother, it really has felt more integrated because we're seeking the Lord together, but I know he's seeking the Lord separately. Like, okay, what do I have for my family? What do you have next? And it's been it's been a really neat journey to walk together in that and trust him in those moments where I'm like, okay, like this is one of those moments, you know, and I look back just really humbled by it because it's just changed even our homeschool. We homeschool our five kids. And I really can say we, because before it was, it was more like on me and I was homeschooling the kids, but now we have like one kid almost each day of the week, now that they're all older and going to his work each week, like one day a week and integrating that. And that's just been, that's just one example, but I have felt like in my motherhood, I'm not alone. And I have a deeper purpose of, you know, what are the orders for today? Okay, kids, you know what dad said, like, let's do this. And anyway, it's, it's been a good shift. I think for me, I I really appreciate what you're saying, Michelle. I can really relate to the things you're saying about like the, the trust that it takes, you know, to be submissive to our husbands. What we're really doing is we're trusting the Lord, that the Lord is going to work in their hearts and that they won't forget about us (laughs) on the way. I think one thing for me is I hear a lot of moms say, but I just want to contribute. I just want to contribute to the family. Mm -hmm. And I think what they're saying is like, I want to get a paycheck and contribute Mm -hmm. financially to the family. And I, I can, I think safely say, I don't think I've ever brought like a penny Mm -hmm. literally to our family. There was that one time I worked at the gap for like five days. (laughs) Yeah, that was your paycheck. Yeah. I think I got like $89 or something like that back in like year one. But like, sometimes that really, like, I feel really bad about that or I'll feel like maybe dumb or insignificant because I haven't contributed $1 to our family's resources. And then I I'm like, okay, that is a lie from the enemy because if we're just saying contributed, like I have contributed a lot to this family and I like for it's what a lie the enemy has done to our Mm -hmm. culture to say that the, the main way you can contribute is financially, you know, so I've contributed my body, my, you know, to bringing children into this family time, sleep, energy, all that stuff. But then also I do work on the businesses and contribute when I can. I'm, I'm a, I'm a spreadsheet gal and (laughs) Jeremy's not. So it's a good, good combo there. So just little ways I've been able to kind of contribute my time, energy, brain, all that stuff. It's obviously waxed and waned with what's going on with the kids because they're my top priority. But I think that in terms of motherhood, I just, you'd have to like redefine a lot of things of what, Mm -hmm. what you think about, like what, what's valuable, what's important, what, what means, what, how am I being significant? You know? do I matter? Does it, you know, so I think that the world and the enemy has done a number on kind of like tricking us ladies into thinking that it's less than, or just, I'm just a mom. I'm just, I'm just a stay at home. I just homeschool my kids. I just birthed how many of them I just, (laughs) you know, and it's just like, wow, no, that's amazing. And that's like, we need to make sure that we like take that back and own that, like from a biblical perspective of the value. Absolutely. And if I can respond to that really quick, April, one moment that you've shared, I'm not sure in what avenue, if it was on a podcast or in person or something, but, um, or maybe it was Jeremy, but where you guys said that I think Jeremy had made plans for a dinner out somewhere and that fell through, but you activated all your kids and you guys had like dinner, everything ready in 15, was it 15 minutes or something like that. And that's really impacted me as a mom, because I'm like, I know that April has trained her kids to like 
it's go time guys. Like let's serve, let's, you know, prepare our home spiritually, emotionally, physically, you know? And so just to speak to that, like you, I've, I've heard of you doing that. And that's, that's a moment that I've often fall back on when we're, you know, helping our kids get ready for a company or anything like that. So just as one example, that's impacted me. Awesome. Well, guys, I thank you so much for sharing. This is, I think this transition for you, those of you guys listening, we know this is a, this is a lot for some people to, to really take on board, to think about this from a very different perspective. And we want to see more family teams develop. We want to see more people working together. We we didn't even get into all the advantages you know this possibly has on on mission, which is something that we're experiencing more and more as the assets get to get to a degree where we can dial down the time necessary and just dial up lots of. I um, mean, a lot of people, of course, use their asset building as as part of the mission, which we've done a lot as well. So that's a huge thing. Uh, Cameron, I wanted to, you to share too, like what like you've got a you got a YouTube channel, yeah. Like uh, where yeah. do people find you guys and what are you, what are you working on there? Yeah. So the busy gardener on YouTube, if you want to see a bunch of different ways to grow fruit trees and other stuff in the garden and uh, Michelle, so you can find us on Instagram at the busy gardeners or Michelle hat is the unhurried farm on oh, nice. Instagram. And so she posts some really cool lifestyle content, some family stuff, thoughts on a lot of these things as well. Excellent. Yeah. I love what you guys are doing. And I know that you're even like, with real estate and what you're building even behind the house, there's a lot going on there. If you guys, <laughs> when you get a glimpse into what the Kramis are doing, obviously they're talking about really practical things on YouTube, but you'll, you'll also see the, the environment that they're creating for their family and, and how, how this, this is working together. So I love that. Um, and I would say too, that for the, another thing to keep in mind is for anyone who's, who's like, I don't even know where to get started. How does this transition work? We created Family Inc. for that reason. So Family Inc. is a one-year coaching program where you can jump in and we have a whole library of business ideas and, and we do eight coaching calls every month for a whole year of group coaching for anyone who wants to make this transition. So go to familyteams.com and sign up for the wait list. We, we open it up two or three times a year for a whole cohort of, um, of families going through. We've got almost 100 families now that have gone through Family Inc. So or, or then the process. So it's been a really fun part of what we try to do to help people make this transition. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, really good with yes. being with you guys. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.